let's go over the test very quickly. The first question was saying find the equivalent capacitance C1, C, uh, of C1, C2, C3 and you can see in this circuit that was given to you. You have a situation like this, right? You had a battery here and you had a capacitor C1, you had a capacitor C3 and you had a capacitor C2. You can see that these two things are in parallel, right? They have the same potential differences across them. You can see these ends are connected at this junction, these ends are connected at this junction, there's nothing else in between them. So the equivalent capacitance of these two is just going to be you know C13 which we can which is C1 plus C3 and then you can see that these two now are in series and so if those two are in series the equivalent capacitance of this thing now is going to be C equivalent which is 1 over 1 over C13 plus 1 over C2 right you can plug in the values okay the second part of the question was saying what is the total energy stored in the capacitors after they are fully charged if this battery voltage is 1000 volts? So you know if you have to find the total energy stored in all of the capacitors taken together you can do it in two ways. Either you can find the energy stored in this capacitor plus this capacitor plus this capacitor or just find the energy stored on the equivalent capacitor right. Either way you will get the same answer. So obviously the easier way would be to say the total energy stored will be half. C equivalent times V square. So once you have found C equivalent, the voltage is given to you 1000 volt and so that is your answer. That is the easiest way to do it, right? And if everything is in SI unit, this should turn out to be in joules. If everything is in SI unit here, this final answer should be in farads, right? Any questions about this? Okay, the second question was asking you about the potential at point P due to lots of diff lots of charges that were given to you and the situation was like this. You had plus 5 Q here, you had minus 5 Q here, you had minus 3 Q here, plus 3 Q here and then here you had two charges, they were minus 2 Q and minus 2 Q and you had to find the potential at point P which is at the center. Do you see that this plus 5 Q and minus 5 Q? will set up potential, remember potential due to a point charge V is K Q over R. First of all potential is a scalar quantity, right? There is no direction here, we are not talking about direction, we are just talking about some scalar quantity. It is true a negative charge produce a negative potential here, a positive charge will produce a positive potential. Since these distances are the same and the charge is have the same magnitude, does everybody see that the potential produced by this charge will totally cancel the produ potential produced by this charge at this point? Similarly for this and this because they are plus 3Q and minus 3Q and these distances are the same. So the only potential that will be produced will be due to this and due to this and so V will be equal to 2 times since both of the, these will and do you see that since these distances are D, they each will produce exactly the same potential because they are the same charges so it will be 2 times K Q is minus 2 Q over D. This is equal to minus 4 K Q over D, right? Please. Go ahead please. Okay, I am just saying that we are calculating the potential, right, which is a scalar quantity and so the only thing that is producing potential here is this one and this one because the potential due to this and this cancel out and due to this and this cancel out, right? Sorry? Thank you very much, that is right. These are D over 2, thanks a lot. This is D over 2, so this is D over 2, so this is D over 2, so this becomes 8, thank you. Any other questions folks? All right, let us look at the next one. It says if the electric field is in the positive x direction and it has a magnitude given by E is equal to C times x cubed where C is a constant, derive an expression for the electrical potential in terms of C and x. So if you remember the relationship between potential and field, if you remember the change in potential is negative of integral 
e dot dl, right, say from the initial to the final point. So in our case, delta v will be equal to minus integral e is given to us to be cx cubed. So the electric field is only dependent on the x direct x coordinate and so e is equal to cx cubed and we will choose this thing to be you know th this is dx right. This is a one dimensional problem and let us say we are going from the origin to some coordinate x and we want to know what is the change in potential when we go from the origin. So we have some coordinate system you know here this is x equal to 0, this is our origin, this is x equal to 1 meter or 1 unit, 2 unit, 3 unit, minus 1 unit, minus 2 etc. And we are going from origin to some any, pla any place x. So then you can see the change in potential is going to be minus c, integral of x cubed is x to the power 4 over 4, if you put this you get this and 0 gives you 0. So this is the potential you know at any point at, with coordinate x compared to origin, right. At origin it will be 0 because x equal to 0 at the origin. Does that make sense? Okay. The, okay, the next question and it is more like a real life question. In, it has a lot of redundant information because in real life as scientists and engineers you will have a lot of different things in your problem and you will have to figure out what is important for figuring something out and what is all garbage. So in this case a lot of information is all garbage. All you need to use for the, for the thing is the current nothing else is important because the question is asking how many electrons are passing through any cross section of the wire each second per second basically. So you have you know maybe some circuit like this whatever is your circuit does not matter the point is there is some current flowing right and this is 4 amps, 4 amps means 4 coulomb per second. And we know what this means if you think about the meaning of current what current is is how many what what is current how much charge of the electron flows per second through any cross section of the wire right isn't that the definition of current through any cross section of this wire how much charge of the electron is flowing per second because it's the current is nothing but the flow of electrons right and this is basically how much charge of the electron is flowing every second through any cross section so all you have to say is that okay so this is this is the total charge per second I have to find that number per second all you have to figure out is in 4 coulomb how much charge there how much how many electrons are there. So remember number will be equal to charge times sorry charge of one electron times the number will be the total charge and so number then will be Q divided by E where E is the elementary charge of one electron and so that is 4 coulomb divided by 1.6 times 10 power minus 19 coulomb and this is 4 divided by 1.6 times 10 power 19 that is it. Okay, the next question says 120 volt potential difference is applied to a space heater whose resistance is 14 ohms when it is hot at what rate is electrical energy transferred to heat. What is the question asking if it is asking about the rate at which energy is transferred to the heat it is asking you about the power dissipated very good. So power dissipated remember will be V square over R sorry right so you are given V is 120 volts square divided by resistance R is 14 ohms so this many watts is your power right and remember watts is what? joules per second so this many joules per second. Now the thing is you are running this thing for 10 hours let us figure out how much energy you, you have used. So energy used in 10 hours will be equal to power times time right and that will be this 120 square divided by 14 joules per second that many joules per second times the time and times is 10 hours, 10 hours let us convert it into seconds, 10, 10 times 60 times 60 right. So this many joules per second times second which is joules, is everybody seeing this is the unit of this is joules, yeah. Okay, now you are told that it costs 
5 cents per 1 kilowatt hour. Okay. So, 1 kilowatt, kilo means 1000, 1000 watt hour, right? So, let me say 1 kilowatt hour is 1000 watt hour, which is 1000 times 60 times 60 um, watt second. And watt second is what? See, watt is joules per second, right? So, this is just nothing but joules. Right? So basically what we are given is that since it this much, so 1000, I'm not going to simplify it times 60 times 60, this many joules costs 5 cents, 1 joule will cost how much? 5 divided by that, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be that? And so we, we have used this much. For us, we are trying to find this much. So what, what will be the cost of 120 square over 14 times 10 times 60 times 60? This much cost, uh, basically 120 square divided by 14 times 10 times 60 times 60. Uh, sorry. This is 1000 times 60 times 60, and then I have this times 10 times 60 times 60. You can see that this conversion of unit was actually not even necessary because if we had wanted, you know, notice that this was in kilowatt hour and you had used the thing for 10 hours, even if you didn't convert the units, it would have worked out fine. So the answer will be this many cents, right? Is everybody with me? So the cost will be 120 square divided by uh, 1400 cents. Any questions, folks? Please. So you didn't really have to like convert all that. You could have just like found the watts and then converted that to kilowatts and multiplied by 10 hours. Yeah, you, because, because you can see that, I mean, uh, the only reason I did it is because it's easier for everybody to think in SI units. But you are right in that this says 10 hours, right? And this one already says kilowatt hour. So you saw that all the conversion into seconds went away anyway, because there was something in the numerator, there was something in the denominator. So it wouldn't have been necessary if you just said, well, five cents is the cost of one kilowatt hour, and I'm using it for 10 hours. So I'll basically just multiply it by 10 and keep things in hours because they'll cancel out anyway. So that would have been fine. I just did it to show you how to get to seconds. If you want to go to SI unit and do it, that's fine. Either way is okay. Any questions, folks? All right. Let's go over the multiple choice questions. So in the multiple choice questions, you had the first one. You know, you had plus Q here. You had plus Q here. You had some, all of these were the same distance as D. You had some point R here, you had some point T here, and you were told if you take a negative charge from here to here, how much would be the work done? And if you remember, work done is the negative of the change in potential energy, which can be written as negative of the charge that you're moving, the test charge, times the change in potential. When, what you have to realize is that the potential at point R, what is the potential at point R? V of R is KQ over R, kq over d due to this charge, right? And the potential due to this charge is also the same. It's kq over d. So the total potential is k 2 kq over d. Similarly, if you look at potential at point t, v sub t is also 2 kq over d because of the fact that this is setting up a potential kq over d and this is setting up a potential kq over d. So the change in potential here is zero. And that's the only thing that's important. So if the change in potential is zero, there's no work done. So the correct answer is zero. Next question says, let Q denote the charge, V denote the potential difference, and U denote the energy. Of these quantities, the capacitors in parallel must have the same watt. And the correct answer is the same potential difference, right? V. There is no guarantee that the energies will be the same. Energies will only be the same if they are exactly the same capacitances. 
but if they have different capacitances the energy stored will be different because it will be half C1 V square and half C2 V square. Okay, the next question says choose all of the following on which the capacitance of a parallel of a spherical capacitor with two infinitesimally thin plates depends and the three things that you had to choose were radius of the inner and outer spherical surfaces, charge on the spherical surfaces, potential difference between the two spherical surfaces. The correct answer was only the radius, the other two things were not correct. So basically we have, we have a capacitor, you know this might be one plate with say some charge, you know let us call R of A with char some charge plus Q, there might be some surface here with some charge minus Q, right and there is some potential difference V between the plus and minus, V is higher potential than sorry plus Q is, uh, the, the surface with plus Q is at a higher potential by an amount V compared to the minus Q surface. We know this, we know that Q is equal to C times V, so the C is equal to Q over V, but C does not depend upon Q or V, why? Because if you change Q, V will change such that Q over V stays constant. In fact, in the note card that I gave you, the formula sheet that I gave you, it even told you what was the capacitance of a capacitor with two plates. It says 4 pi epsilon 0 R of A, R of B divided by R B R minus R A. This is something that we had derived. I am not going to re-derive it. You can see it only depends upon the radii and not on the charges or the potential differences because the ratio of the two will always stay, stay constant and it will only depend upon the radii. Any questions about that? Okay. Let us look at the next one. It says the electric field is 0 in a region of space. Which one of the following is true? And the correct answer is that what? Potential is constant. That is right. Not potential is 0, but potential is constant. That is what you have to realize because you know delta V is equal to minus integral E dot DL. You know if this is 0 everywhere. Everywhere, if you go from any initial point, suppose this is your region, you go from some initial point to some final point, if the electric field is 0 here, 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 the integral of that thing will be 0 also and that means delta V is 0 and that means VI is equal to VF. That means there is no change in potential, the potential is constant, it is an equipotential region. Does that make sense? Okay. The potential is not 0. Electric field 0 does not mean potential is 0, it means potential is constant, right? Okay. If the radius of the plates is doubled and the plate separation is also doubled, the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor will what? Yeah, it will double because if you remember C is equal to epsilon 0 A over D, right? This is assuming there is no dielectric. If you have a dielectric, you can put a kappa, but you can see that a is equal to pi r square. So what you are given here is r goes to 2r and d goes to 2d. Do you see that c nu will become kappa epsilon 0 pi 2r square divided by 2d and one of these 2's get cancelled and so in the end what we end up with will be 2 times c old. This is the old c. So the correct answer is the capacitance will double. Okay, the next question was the equipotential surfaces associated with an isolated point charge R. What is the answer? Yeah, the correct answer is uh, concentric spheres centered at the charge. So if you remember, if you have a point charge, the, it's the electric field lines that are like this, right? Do you remember electric field lines are like this? Because several people were asking me, is it going to be radially? I mean, I'm not going to answer the question, but obviously, the what is radially outward is the electric field lines, right? And equipotential surfaces are concentric spheres and centered at the charge. So this will be a surface where V is equal to KQ over R. You can see all of the points on this equipotential surface, which is concentric with this charge, is going to be at the same potential because Q is the same, the charge that is producing the potential and R is the same at all points. Is not that true? And it is true that maybe the potential here is 10 volts, maybe the potential here is 5 volts. So this is one equipotential surface where the potential is 5 volts. 
this is another equipotential surface where potential is 10 volts. As you go farther and farther away from a positive charge, the equipotential surfaces will have smaller and smaller potential. Wouldn't they? Okay, let us look at the next one. It says in a conductor carrying current, we expect the electron drift speed to be much greater than the speed of electron between collision, much less than the speed of electron between the collision, about the same as the speed of the electron between collision, much less. The correct answer is much less. Why? Because if you think about it, you have a wire, you know, and the thing is you have applied some potential difference and electrons are, electrons are actually moving, but they actually bump into ions, they move back, they bump into another ion, move back. The, the speed with which they are moving between two collisions is extremely fast. You know, they could be moving as fast as like 10 to the power 6 meters per second, extremely fast, but the drift, drift speed is very, very slow. You know, drift speed could be 10 to the power minus 5 meters per second for all you know, right? As opposed to 10 to the power plus 5 meters per second for the speed of the electron between collision. So the reason electrons are drifting so slowly, remember I told you that if you have a 1 ampere current flowing in a copper wire, in one hour, the electrons would have drifted by only one third of a meter. You can see how their motion is being impeded by these collisions. You know, they don't drift very fast at all. Even though they are trying to, you know, speed, they are speeding, but they keep colliding into these ions and their overall net drifting is very slow, right? Because the drift speed is the average speed with which they are moving forward. Okay, for an ohmic resistance, sorry, for an ohmic substance, the resistivity rho depends upon, yeah, if you, in fact, if you even had a formula in your note card that says that resistivity, if you look at the note, note card that I gave you, it says resistivity is equal to the mass of the electron divided by the charge of the electron square times the number of electrons per unit volume times the time between collision. So the correct answer was time between collision. Resistivity again does not depend upon the electric field, it does not depend upon the current density, right? Is everybody agreeing that even though rho is equal to E divided by J, rho does not depend upon E or J. Why? Because if you increase the electric field because you use a battery that pr provides a higher potential difference, the current density will increase such that this ratio stays constant. Right, And if you change the temperature, it is true that if you change the temperature, the only thing you are going to change is this time, time, time between collisions, right? Why? Because the ions are going to start vibrating faster and the periodicity is going to get destroyed more and more at higher temperature, right? Okay. Any questions about any of this? Okay. Then let us move on and magnetism is due to moving charges. Now, moving charges is a little bit of a vague word. For example, if there is a current flowing in the wire, do you think it will produce a magnetic field? Yes, it will. So the thing is, and in fact, that is the kind of uh, magnetic field that is always used commercially. Because we have things under our control. If we increase the current, you will see, later on you will see that if we increase the current in the wire, the magnetic field will keep increasing proportionately. So if we need very high magnetic field for some application like say MRI or for example um, for having magnetically levitated trains or something, then in those cases we really need to pass very high currents in the wire to produce very high magnetic field. Of course, one there is one problem here, you know, if you pass very high current, even if these wires are copper wires which have very low resistance, high current would mean that power dissipation in the form of heat I square times R is going to be a lot, right? And because of that, the wire can heat up, it can melt. And so you will see, I don't know if any of you has ever had an MRI done, but the thing is, I have had it done. You will hear in your ears this clicking sound. And if you ask the operator, what is the sound? They'll say, oh, we are cooling these wires in this helium bath, you know, that cools it down. Cooling is the only thing that can decrease your resistance. And people really cool things down to very low temperature. And that's why these MRI scans are so expensive. They're more than a thousand bucks each. It's the expense in cooling down the coils in which you are shoved in order to make sure that the wire doesn't melt 
when it is trying to produce the magnetic field that will image your brain or whatever you know uh, parts of your body for example. So the point is that you know we always have to remember that. Now there we, I also said to you that bar magnets behave magnetic because of what? Because of this thing called spin of the electron, electron has this property called spin and because of this property called spin bar magnets behave as, as magnets. So now what is this spin you know you may be thinking or oh well what is the real difference between whether you talk, talk about it as spin or whether you talk about it as just motion of electrons in a wire as in the case of current actually there is a difference you know. So for example the spin of an electron is should not be thought of as the spin of the earth around its own axis or the you know orbital motion of the earth around sun I mean you are right I mean if you are thinking of orbital motion of uh, earth around the sun versus the spin of spinning of earth around its own axis they are both the same kind of motion at least they are mo both motion in real space. But spinning of electron is not really due to any thing like this you, you should not be really thinking of electron as spinning in real space. Spin is an intrinsic thing that comes to all the particles. And if you really thought that electron was spinning about its own axis and that is what spin is actually that is wrong because you can show that all the things that will be calculated from there will turn out to be wrong. So the point is that all elementary particles has something intrinsic to them called spin for example for electron it happens to be half for proton it happens to be half for neutrons it happens to be half for all the quarks it happens to be half you know spin this is an intrinsic thing and this spin even though it is not a real motion it is something very much like it even though it is intrinsic and it causes a magnetic moment it causes a magnet uh, causes magnetism and so but we will not talk about the physics of bar magnets here very much because we do not know much about spin at least in this course unless we learn quantum mechanics we would not be able to sp understand spin very well. So in this course most of our focus is going to be on understanding the magnetism of current carrying wires. But when, when you know whenever I get a chance I will try to compare things with a bar magnet because bar magnets are something that you are familiar with. Now you might say well okay so how is it that a bar magnet starts behaving magnetic whereas this e eraser here is not magnetic you know does not this have electron and does not uh, do not the electrons in this, this uh, eraser also have spin you are right they do have spin. But it turns out that when something beca be becomes magnetic and something has a north and a south pole it turns out that all the electrons in this material will have their spin such that on you know here I am showing the spin with an arrow that, that on an average there is some direction to the you know spin. On the other hand in this eraser all the atoms electrons in different atoms might have their spin pointed randomly so that there is no net magnetism even though yes each electron itself does have magnetism overall this whole material has no magnetic property because the thing averages out to 0 because all the electrons have their magnetic properties you know in random direction because of the fact that their spin is all random in this material. On the other hand in a real magnet on an average there is a direction to it and that is why you see the macroscopic effect you can really see the magnet attracting or repelling another magnet. Now how is it that refrigerator doors get attracted or repelled even though that is not a magnet it is but it is made of something that is called a magnetic material. So it turns out iron, cobalt, nickel these kinds of things are magnetic materials and even though right now if you take one iron blob next to an extra iron next to another iron blob do you think they will attract or repel no. But if you take a magnet close to an iron blob the magnet does attract the iron piece why is that because it turns out that the iron actually has its spin spins aligned when it comes next to a magnet. So the magnet exerts a force on those spins and it kind of lines them up at least temporarily when you remove the magnet the iron may not retain its magnetic properties at least fully even though a little bit might be retained not complete not the whole thing may be retained and because of that you would not see that the iron behaves magnetic after you have removed the mag magnet. But you know the one thing that you might say is why is how did I make this piece of magnet anyway 
actually the piece of magnet was made this bar magnet was turned made from a magnetic material by putting it in a very strong magnetic field. If the spins got aligned even if you turned off the current it stayed aligned and now it has turned into a permanent magnet your little toy that you play with you know north south poles you know everybody is playing with these magnets and so the point is that by putting a piece of iron in a very very strong magnetic field you can line up the spins sufficiently that even after you have removed the current the magnetism stays. Now we all know that uh, if remember I told you if I cut this thing into two parts it turns out that this will turn into a south pole and this will turn into a north pole. If I cut this into two parts north south north south if I cut this into two parts south north. So even to at the level of an electron I keep cutting it each little piece will develop a north and a south pole. Now I, I do not want you to think that north pole and south pole have anything to do with charges accumulating in one region or the other it has absolutely nothing to do with charges accumulating it just has to do with which way is the electron spins pointing ok it uh, there is no accumulation of charge here nothing is, is that clear to everybody. Now one thing I wanted to talk about is what is the magnetic field lines due to a bar magnet before we move on to something else. So north south it turns out magnetic field lines come out of the north pole go towards the south pole but they do not stop they keep going. So this is what is called the magnetic field lines. <coughs> Similarly I could have another magnetic field lines that will be like this. There could be another magnetic field lines that is like this. etc. One thing and do you remember that magnetic field lines if you take the tangent to the magnetic field line that will give you the direction of magnetic field and we are going to denote magnetic field with a symbol B. So magnetic field is obviously a vector so if I wanted to know what is the magnetic field here I am going to draw a tangent to the curve here that will give me the direction of magnetic field. Now wherever the magnetic field lines are closer together denser I will say the magnetic field is stronger there wherever they are not as dense I will say the magnetic field is not as dense there right it is not as strong there right. So does everybody see that the magnetic field lines are forming closed loops there is something else very funny about a magnet which is very different from what you have learned in electricity that is you can never separate a north pole from a south pole do you see that north pole and south pole are always together in fact in physics there are theories that say there is nothing that actually stops somebody from, from finding a magnetic monopoles just like you have you can just have positive charges if you like or you can just have negative charges right but unfortunately nobody has ever found just north pole or just south pole. So even at the level of electron even an electron itself has a north and south pole due to its spin you know you can have a direction associated with it you can call one direction south one direction south north. So we have never found a magnetic monopoles now is there any so this magnet is more like what an electric dipole does not it look a little bit like electric dipole but there is a major difference let me draw for you so a magnet is really a magnetic dipole you can always call a, this magnet a magnetic dipole because do you see by dipole we mean it has two poles north and south. Now if you think of an electric dipole what does it look like see if it is plus here plus q here minus q here do you remember the electric field lines in this case always go from plus to minus do not they. So can somebody tell me if you can see any difference between an electric dipole and a magnet or a magnetic dipole. So this is a magnet 
or a magnetic dipole tell me anybody sees any difference in the electric field lines these are the electric field lines right if you take the tangent of, to, to this it gives you the electric field here you take the tangent to this here it gives you the electric field here etc just like the tangent to these magnetic field lines are giving you the magnetic field produced by that bar magnet is there any difference you see go ahead please very good so as he correctly points out in this case if you see the north pole sorry the positive charge happens to be a source of these lines so in other words the field lines are always coming out of the positive do you see that on the other hand that's not the case here outside the magnet the field lines are going the magnetic field lines are going out of the north pole but inside the magnet they are going towards the north pole do you see there is a difference between inside and outside in other words if you trace a magnetic field line it will always form closed loops if you trace this it's not forming a closed loop if you look look it's going like this and hey there's nothing going towards it do you see that in fact things electric field lines always come out of the positive charges and go towards and end at negative charges that's not the case for a magnet in this case the field lines always form closed loops as you can see is is that difference clear so it's a it's a different situation one more thing that i wanted to tell you is that earth is a magnet do you know but a very weak magnet and in fact the geographic no, ge geographic north pole is pretty close to the magnetic south pole and vice versa but earth's magnetism is so weak that if you bring even your bar magnet close to something then earth's magnetism can be ignored so only if there's nothing else you know close if you if you're bringing bringing two two bar magnets next to each other you can just ignore the effect of earth so effect of earth is extremely weak in fact we are going to to talk next time about what is the unit of magnetic field how we can do things etc but have a great weekend Professor Singh is a lecturer in the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh. For more information about Professor Singh and her research, visit her website in the description below.